glad you could be here with us here this Sunday on our very first Sunday of Advent. And so to kick things off from the beginning, we're going to start by the tradition of lighting the Advent candle. So Helen is going to come and look after that for us. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means coming. And in this season, we prepare for the coming of Christ. Today, we light the candle of hope. The people of Israel hoped in God's promises and were not disappointed. Again and again, God delivered Israel from its enemies. We, too, have the same experience of salvation. That is why we believe in God's promise to send Jesus to us once again to judge the world and establish his kingdom on earth. Oops. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, matches always give me a hard time too. Hope is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this, at the light of this candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to begin our celebration of Advent as we can look to on the road towards Christmas, towards your coming as, as a human to save us. And so, Lord, I pray that even now that you would help us to, to focus in on, on what this season means to us. Help us, Lord, to begin to think about the hope that we have in you, the hope that we want to share with others. I pray, Lord, that if anybody has come in here this morning with a feeling of hopelessness, and really struggling with what they've been experiencing. Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would speak peace, you would speak comfort, you would speak hope into our hearts so that we would leave here with a renewed sense of who you are and that you are in control. I pray, Lord, that you would um, forgive us, Lord, for things that we've done this week that have hurt you, hurt others, and hurt ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we've failed to do that we should have done. I pray, Lord God, that you would cleanse us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the cross and the gift of your forgiveness. And I just pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would do something in each of our lives this morning um, that would last for eternity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may not be able to see it from where you're sitting, but our, our little candle, um, candle wreath that we have here, it contains five candles. And I was just kind of noticing this morning the fact that most of them, this isn't the first time they're going to be lit. Most of these candles have been lit before. They've got you know the black wick and the melted wax. And it struck me that not only are we lighting our candle here this morning, not only are churches all around town and all around the county and the country and the world doing the same thing this morning, lighting a candle in the name of hope, but, I mean, we did the same thing last year and the year before and the year before. Hope doesn't just sort of start all over again when it's time to do the ritual. Hope is something that we carry with us. When these candles are all lit and burned out, the hope still lights. The hope is still burning in us. And it's just something that struck me this morning, looking at these candles that have already been um, burned once for us. So, and uh, thank you to Phyllis and everybody for decorating the sanctuary. The, the colors are so beautiful this morning. Um, as we continue in our adventures in uh, not being able to sing together as much as we would like, as much as we have been accustomed to, to doing over the years. We have been exploring some uh, American Sign Language vocabulary and some expressions that just give us that extra, extra depth. You know, when we sing, we have the, the notes and the instruments to, to sort of lift us up and to give us that extra expression. Um, when we just speak, we're just speaking. So we're finding that, that bringing some American Sign Language 
into our expression of worship is just giving us an extra dimension, an extra layer, an extra opportunity to express ourselves in a new way. So we have two new words for this morning, and I bet you can't guess what they are. Hey, one. Anybody got another one? Guessing? No. Candle. Candle is our other, other uh, our word. So candle is one finger up like this, and then, <clears throat> no, you know what? I'm doing it backwards. Sorry. Scratch that. Never mind. It's one finger like this, and then this is your flame. This is candle. And hope is um, two hands <coughs> straight up like this. <coughs> Excuse me. And then do, close them down like that. It's like you're putting a lid on something. And this is hope. So this morning we have lit the candle of hope. And we're going to speak together some words that will be on the screen that just kind of walk us through uh, what our intention is when we light this candle this morning. You know, Jeff reminded us of, of the scriptural basis of this and, and, you know, where that all comes from. And uh, so we're just going to speak together some of those words to remind ourselves of why we do this. So we begin by saying, we light this candle because we live in hope. We wake every day knowing what God has promised, that the low will be lifted up, that the rough, uneven ground will be made smooth. We light this candle because we live in hope, that the unreachable will be brought within reach, that the glory of the Lord, his love and power will appear, and that all people together will see it. We light this candle because we live in hope. God has promised and his promises will be kept. We light this candle because we live in hope. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Corinthians chapter 15, starting to read at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Father, thank you for hope. Thank you, Lord, for your word that points us to hope. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, even now, what you would want to say to us through this message. Take my weak words, infuse them with your spirit, that they may become words that would speak to our lives, speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and cause us, Lord, to, uh, to see something in us, see something in you that maybe we've never noticed before, and that we could leave this place in some way changed. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we know, we're beginning the season of Advent this morning, our journey to Christmas Day, the celebration of the birth of the Christ child. I don't know about you, but Christmas, like every year, I guess, it always kind of sneaks up on me. It's like, it's one day it's October, and the next day it's November 29th, and it's like, what happened? I got to order gifts. Um, but Advent is here, and its focus is 
Hope, peace, joy, and love represented by the four candles that we will light. And this morning we lit the candle of hope. And yesterday, I, I was, hope was kind of staring me in the face. I looked at this magazine in my apartment, and it was from this organization called One Hope Canada, which runs uh, Christian summer camps all over Canada. And then I got in the car, and there's an envelope male sitting on my front seat, and it's, it's the Salvation Army letter. It talks about big words, hope, with, a, with the Salvation Army symbol and a big wreath where the O should be. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I think you're trying to tell me something. The message of hope is a huge part of Christmas. And we spoke a lot about hope this past summer as we were going through Charles Swindoll's book, Hope Again. And we made the point then that hope in the biblical sense is not exactly the same as we use the word hope today. Today, the words hope and wish are kind of interchangeable, right? Uh, I, I hope I get that promotion at work. I hope I'll pass that exam. I hope I get nice Chris gifts for Christmas. It's, it's, it's a wish. It's something that we want, but we're not sure it's going to happen. But in scriptures, the word hope is used to denote something that is totally 100% sure, something that definitely will happen, something that we can count on. As we come to the end of 2020, there are many in society who have become fairly weary. The world seems to have changed so much, and things that we thought we can count on and hope in have let us down, proven themselves to be less than trustworthy. Many have said with a sense of resignation and maybe even hopelessness that, that we just need to get used to a new normal, that, that nothing in life will ever be the same again. Some quite aren't so uh, pessimistic, but they still wrestle with a temptation to hopelessness and a desire to, to reach out to something that they can place their hope in. People can find themselves putting their hope in government. In the U.S. this, this month, we saw a country whose hopes were split right down the middle. There are those who placed politics and elections in the right perspective in the big scheme of things, but there are those who, who repeatedly said this election is the most important thing that ever happened to America like in a century, and, and they put all their hopes in whoever won, some in the Democrats, some in the Republicans. And for many people, if their side were to lose, that very real sense of hopelessness would set in. There are people on each side who believe that their side needs to be in power in order for, to save the country. And if the other side gets power, then, then hope, America's doomed. America is beyond hope. In Canada, our views may not be as polarized, but we still look to government as a source of hope. And maybe even more so in some ways, we, we've placed our hope in these government subsidies that put us more into debt in order to, to help get us through the pandemic financially. And there's nothing wrong with desiring a government that we can place confidence in that they'll govern wisely and for the good of all. But I think we cross a line when we begin to put our hope in politicians and polit political parties and begin to feel that all hope is lost if our, if our group doesn't win. In the last week or so, the news has been filled with hopeful stories about a vaccine for COVID-19. A vaccine is something that has been held out for many months as a hope for getting life back to normal. And some have despaired of life even returning to normal without having a vaccine. And while a vaccine is a valid hope, just like Jonas Salk and his vaccine brought hope to the end of polio back in the 1950s, it will still not solve all of our problems. Problems that faced society and individuals pre-COVID-19 will still be there post-COVID-19 that we need to face and deal with. Sometimes people put all their hope in wealth we figure that if we have enough money, investment, savings, that, that we can be confident of weathering any storm. And I'm sure there are people that felt that way in 1929, at the beginning of the Great Depression, who fell into hopelessness when their wealth was just wiped out. I think society has learned enough, I hope society, see, I wish, I wish society has learned enough from its mistakes that something to that degree may not happen again, but there are still fluctuations in the economy that, that can be devastating for people and can steal hope. I've heard it said, people talk about depressions and recessions in the economy. I've heard it said that a, de that a depression is when an economic downturn affects me. A recession is when it only affects other people. We never know when an economic downturn might affect us directly. And whatever the impact, wealth is uncertain enough so as not to merit placing our hope in. 
1 Timothy 6.17 tells us, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Wealth is so much more uncertain than it might seem at first glance. Sometimes we put our hope in relationships. When we're single, we think, oh, if I could just marry the right person, then my life will be on track and everything will fall into place if I could just find the right boyfriend or girlfriend. We look to our friends and family as people we can lean on, people we can hope in. And I'm sure that there are those close to us who, who really, in all, you know, their desire is to do all that they possibly can to be supportive and to be a source of hope to us. But still, they are only human. And there are times when they may not be able to live up to our high expectations of them. They may not be able to provide the hope that we need in all circumstances. And COVID has exacerbated that this year, as we were talking about with the high school students, as, as we're restricted in the ways we can connect with people. And our relationships with many people have been related to phone calls and Zoom chats. And there are many who are experiencing great loneliness and it's impacting many other areas of their lives. Many of the things that people put their hope in are not really bad in themselves, but when we search for certain hope in things that are inherently uncertain, we cannot help but end up disappointed, and our lives become less than what God has planned for them. For as we approach this Advent season, and focus on hope, we realize that only one thing is certain. Only one thing is worthy of our hope. Benjamin Franklin wrote many years ago that the only things certain in this world are death and taxes. But the reality is that the only thing certain, the only one we can truly put our hope in is Jesus Christ, his life and death and resurrection. 1 Peter 1.3 tells us, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Jesus, we have a living hope. It's not a hope based on a philosophy or an idea. It's not a hope based on a political ideology. It's not a hope based on the teachings of some person long dead. It's a hope based on a living Savior. Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus Christ is alive today, and he infuses us with a living hope by his spirit, living within us as we welcome him to be our Savior and Lord. Our hope, our hope in Jesus is hope based on the certainty of a past event that has incredible impact on our present lives. Well, probably two events or a whole group of events. The advent of Jesus as a baby in a manger, come to live the entirety of human experience and to take our place on the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. And because he lives, scripture says we too shall live, and that is our hope. Holding on to the hope that comes our way through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus impacts our life in the present. It's not just a past event, it's something that happened in history, but it's a living reality today. Hebrews 10, 23, 24 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. As we place our hope in Jesus, it encourages others to do the same. And it encourages us to look past ourselves and to spur one another on to good deeds and to love in Jesus' name. Because when we're immersed in hopelessness, you know, it's hard to take your eyes off yourself. It's hard to take your eyes off your situation. All you can see is the, the despair and the hopelessness. And soon hopelessness morphs into indifference. And if there's no hope for anything better, we start to think, well, why bother? Why should anything matter? Why should I care about anyone or anything? But hope opens our eyes and helps us to see beyond ourselves. We not only hope for the best in ourselves, but we also hope for the best in others. And we want to do all that we can to, to help others achieve the best. 
Our hope in Jesus encourages. Our hope in Jesus motivates. We know that he's faithful to look after us. We can rest in hope in him, which then gives us the freedom to, to take a risk, step outside our comfort zone, and reach out and care for others. For when we are engrossed in our own needs, it's hard to see or even care about the needs of others. In Christ, we know that we've been given a new birth into a living hope. The new birth that he has given us in the past is a hope that we can hold on to for our salvation, for our relationship with God, and for becoming the person that God created us to be, fulfilling his purposes for our lives. And part of that is to spur one another on, or to be spurred on, to love and good deeds, which bless others, and which share with them the hope that they too can find in Christ. And ultimately, we are, ultimately we are pointed to, in Christ to our ultimate hope, the hope of the life to come, of a life forever in relationship with our Heavenly Father that now we have only a foretaste of. We were talking a few weeks ago about suffering and about persevering through suffering and about how the hope of heaven, the hope of the life to come, is a powerful source of strength, and perseverance, knowing that our light and momentary afflictions are not worth comparing with the life that is to come. As much as Jesus has promised us an abundant life here and now on this earth, it's only a foreshadowing of what is to come. And in that, we can confidently place our hope. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, which we read earlier, tells us this. If only for this life, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, are of all people most to be pitied. Notice it doesn't say, if only in this life we have hope, we should be pitied. And in light of all we've talked about so far, that would make sense. If we had just put our hope in this life, then we should be pitied. If we're placing all of our hope solely in governments or vaccines or wealth or relationships, that we would truly be missing out on the hope that God has called us to and should be pitied. But it says this, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we should be pitied. Life in Christ is what God has called us to. In Christ, we can fulfill the purpose of why we were created. We can become the person that God created us to be. But that's only part of the story. Our hope is not only in this life, but it's also in the life to come. And it is a hope that is sure for those who have placed their hope in Christ. For as surely as Christ came in the first advent that we celebrate, so through his resurrection from the dead and by his promises that are sure and true, he will come again in the second advent and will make all things new. 1 Peter 1.13 tells us, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is received or is revealed at his coming. You know, even as Christians, we can fall into the trap, and into the rut of thinking that this life is all there is. I mean, we might assent to the belief of an afterlife, but, but in practice, how we think and live out our lives, we fall into a rut of thinking this is all there is. We can become somewhat short-sighted and not relying on the hope to be brought to us when Jesus comes again and ushers in his kingdom. And when that happens, I think then it's then that we start to, to place our, our hopes where they don't really belong. And as such, we begin to even lose our hope. On the flip side, there are others who can fall into the rut of just waiting for heaven. Well, I'm just life here doesn't really matter. I'm just focusing on heaven. They look forward so much to the day, to that day, at the expense of being spurred onto love and good deeds now, in this life today. The hope of the second advent of Jesus, the hope of our home in heaven, should not be something that is, is neglected so that we, we focus so much on this world that we become one to be pitied. Nor should that hope become, become so all-encompassing and all-engrossing that we neglect Jesus' instructions to occupy, to keep busy for him until he comes again. That we should look, look so much to the future that we forget what we're called to do in the present. 
but rather may the hope of life with Jesus in eternity motivate us. May it motivate us, spur us on to love and good deeds in the here and now. May the hope of life in eternity with Jesus motivate us to have an eternal perspective on our stuff, on our wealth. May we own our stuff. May our stuff never own us. May we be motivated to invest our lives in things that last forever rather than what the scripture calls wood, hay, and stubble that will be burned up in the end. I mentioned Charles Swindoll with a book we were going through before. He's one of the few radio preachers I actually listen to. And um, I heard a sermon one time where he said, there are only two things in life that last forever, people and God's word. And a life with a perspective of eternity will want to spend time and effort and energy on those things, people and God's word, that will last for eternity. May our hope of life in eternity with Jesus motivate us for ministry and evangelism. May it spur us on to love and good deeds. May we be motivated by the fact that life here has a time limit and that God has left us here to serve him and to touch others for him in that relatively brief time that he's given us. May we be motivated by the fact that there are those within our sphere of influence, those that we rub shoulders with daily or weekly, who would, if you talk to them about the second advent, about Jesus coming again, about the end of the world as we know it, they would not see that as being a hopeful thing. They have placed their hope in things uncertain. And they need motivated Christians who will help show them the living hope that they can find in Jesus Christ. And may our hope of life in eternity with Jesus motivate us to endure suffering and hardship. Scripture tells us that our light and momentary afflictions do not compare with the glory that awaits us. It doesn't mean that our suffering in this life won't bring pain, won't bring difficult. It doesn't mean that, that God won't bring relief to our suffering, either by changing the circumstances or by giving us the strength to bear up under it. But what it does mean is that we have hope. A hope that is not just a wish, but a hope that is sure. One day, Scripture says, he will wipe every tear from our eye. One day there will be not a trace of sin or disease or death. One day the light of his presence that we can only see dimly now will shine with the brilliance of his glory and darkness will be no more. Hope in Christ is more than a wish. Our hope in Christ is something sure. As the book of Hebrews tells us, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that in your coming, as a babe in a manger, in your coming, living the entirety of the human experience, in your coming to to die on the cross and rise from the dead, you have made our hope sure, our hope of salvation as we turn to you. And you've made our hope sure of what's to come. And we thank you, Lord, that amidst things that that are uncertain, amidst things that can be very difficult to place our hope in and that we shouldn't, um, that you've given us something sure, that you've given us yourself here and now, a life more abundant, a life that, that fulfills the purpose for our creation, a life that, that makes us all that you created us to be. We thank you, Lord, that we can place our hope in you, a living hope, hope that is sure. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope of a home in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for bringing salvation to us. Thank you, Lord, for opening up that door where we can ask for forgiveness, where we can repent, where we can come to you and receive you and receive your hope. 
Help us, Lord, when we are tempted to hopelessness, especially in this, this time that we're in right now, and when our eyes get fixed on the things about us, when we spend way too much time watching the news and on social media, and when we, we listen to all the concerns around us, Help us, Lord, never to lose sight of the living hope. Help us, Lord, never to lose sight of the hope that you've given us for today and the hope that we have for tomorrow. Help us, Lord, to rest in that hope and may that hope see us through whatever difficult times we face now and in the days to come. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing As we were singing that, I was drawn to a phrase from Scripture that encourages us to live in the light of his returning. To live in the light of his returning. May we, this week, may we live in the hope, the living hope of Jesus, knowing that one day he will return to establish his kingdom, to make all things new. And if that happens in our lifetime, praise the Lord. If it doesn't happen in our lifetime, we know that we live in the living hope of heaven that has been promised to us who have placed our trust in Christ. And may this week, may that truth that we always know, and it's always there in the back of our minds, may it really sink in. And may that impact how we live our lives this week. May it spur us on to love and good deeds in Jesus Christ. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you want to visit within here, within, keep a, a good distance, keep your masks on. It's kind of nice outside, but cold if you want to visit outside too. God bless. Thanks for being here.